today's topic may sound boring or complex or cumbersome, but the truth is that the history of the Jewish calendar is utterly fascinating for many reasons. When we learn a little bit about how they managed the calendar in yesteryear, it opens up a window into the way that our ancestors lived their lives thousands of years ago. And also it, I think, in addition, demonstrates the Jewish perspective on the role of humans and the role of tradition and the role of law, the role that we have as a court, as a nation, as a community to be arbiters of law and halacha. I think in addition, some of the stories surrounding the calendar highlight the genius and the cleverness of the sages in the ways that they navigated and overcame some of the significant hurdles that could have wreaked havoc on the Jewish community. And I think also learning about some of the conflicts that arose over the Jewish calendar, it shows us some of the challenges that we face as a nation when there's internal division and discord and how devastating it is when there's treasonous actors trying to sabotage the nation from within. So the subject is the history of the Jewish calendar. Now, before we begin, I want to let everyone know that on Wednesday, the 21st of March, which is the day that this podcast is going to be released, our organization, Torch, is going to be doing our annual fundraising campaign. This is a unique campaign because it's only one day, it's 24 hours, beginning at 1 p.m. Central Time on Wednesday and ending at 1 p.m. Central Time on Thursday. And the objective of this campaign is to essentially raise the majority of what we need for our budget for all our outreach and educational activities that we do for the year. Our philosophy is let's try to compress all our fundraising to one day, and that way we could focus the rest of the time on the more important things, teaching, doing podcasts. This past year, we had over 200,000 downloads of the podcast from all 118 countries in the world and all 50 states. And obviously, if you're listening, you're enjoying the podcast. So if you want to support our efforts, go right now. The website is givetorch.org, givetorch.org, and participate in our campaign. And I appreciate it. Thank you for downloading. Thank you for listening. As always, please email me, rabbiwolbe at gmail.com. And thank you for listening. And let us continue with the podcast. So let's give the background of the Jewish calendar. So in chapter 12 of the book of Exodus, we find the Jewish nation being commanded with a mitzvah for the first time. If you read the book of Genesis, there are mostly stories, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Jacob's children's. And there's very few commandments. There's, of course, the commandment of circumcision. There's the commandment given to Jacob not to eat the sciatica. There's the commandment to be fruitful and multiply. But that's it. Three mitzvos in the book of Genesis. In the book of Exodus, once our nation is formed in the Exodus, there is a barrage and a torrent of mitzvos. So what's the very first one? Chapter 12 of the book of Exodus to make the calendar. The Almighty commands Moshe and Aaron, inaugurate new months, make leap years, assign the yearly festivals per the months of the year. Essentially, this mitzvah gives humans, gives the, the Jewish people and its leaders the reins to fix the calendar. Now, this is sort of tricky. And the reason why it's tricky is because the Jewish calendar follows a lunar month. The month goes with the moon, but a solar year, the year goes with the sun. In the Western world, managing and maintaining a calendar is not very difficult. Why? Because the majority of the world follows the Gregorian calendar. It's a civil calendar, which just follows the solar year. Solar year is 365 and a quarter days. So every year you have 365 days. Every four years, you add a leap year. You add one day, February 29th. Because it's slightly less than a quarter of a day, it's only five hours and 55 minutes every 100 years, even though it's 25 times four, every 100 years you don't have a leap year, every 400 years you do have, but it's, it's very simple. It's very, it's very fixed. It's not so complicated. However, we have a lunar month, but we also have a solar year. Now, the lunar month means that the days of the month revolve around the moon. The moon begins, of course, the month as a very small sliver, 
And then as it phases up, and it's what's called the waxing stages, it gets bigger. In the middle of the month, it's a full moon. So we know we have Jewish holidays, Jewish festivals. We have Pesach upcoming, circus. Both of them are in the middle of the month. If you walk out, any Pesach night, Pesach Seder night, or the first night of circus, you'll walk out, you'll see a full moon. Whereas we also have months, uh, we, we also have festivals that are in the beginning of the month. So, for example, Rosh Hashanah is the first day of the month, a very small sliver. And that's how we have a month. Now, the length of a lunar month is about 29 and a half days. To be precise, it's 29 days, 12 hours, 44 minutes, 3 seconds, and change. A little bit more. And the reason why is because halachically, a hour is not broken down into 60 Part 60 minutes, instead it's broken down into 1,080 chalakim, portions. And therefore, each one of those is roughly 3.3 seconds. But for simplicity's sake, lunar month is 29 and a half days. Now, of course, the month has to be a certain amount of days. You can't say, that, oh, this month is halfway through the day, it's a new month. Obviously, it doesn't make any sense. So a month is either going to be 29 days long, it's going to be on the shorter end. Some months are going to be 29 days long. And some months are going to be 30 days long. And that's going to allow there to be a balance to allow some months to be a little bigger and some months to be a little smaller. And this mitzvah that we're commanded in the book of Exodus is that it gives the Jewish nation and the Jewish nation's leadership, beginning, of course, with Moshe and Aaron, and then their successors, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish high court of law, they are the ones who are tasked with determining which months are 29 days, and which month are 30 days. Now, if the only thing we needed to do was to maintain a lunar month, it would still be fairly simple. The problem is, is that we have to accommodate the lunar month, either 29 or 30 days, along with a solar year. Now, why do we have to do that? Because the Torah tells us in the book of Deuteronomy that the holiday of Pesach is in the spring which means that it has to be in a certain season. Of course, the seasons follow the cycles of of the solar year. It depends upon where we are, at where Earth is, with relation to the sun, sun determines which season we're in. And therefore, because we're told that we have to have Pesach in the springtime, that means that we have to find a way to balance the lunar month and the solar year. Now, a little bit of math, but bear with me here. If a lunar month is 29 and a half days, and there's 12 months in the year, so you multiply 12 times 29 and a half, you end up with 354. So if we just had a lunar month and a lunar year, every year would be 354 days long. The problem is, as we know, the solar year is 365 days long. And therefore, if we just followed, if we just maintained a lunar month and a lunar year, Every year, Pesach would be 11 days earlier in the cycle. So maybe if you started off by the spring, Pesach's in the spring, but very soon, Pesach comes earlier and earlier in the year. And before you know it, Pesach is in the winter. And then Pesach will be in the fall. And Pesach will be in the summer. And then Pesach will be again in the spring. And we won't be able to fulfill the mitzvah, the commandment that we're told that Pesach has to be in the spring. Now, incidentally, the Muslim calendar actually works like that. The Muslim calendar, it's a lunar calendar, but it's not adjusted for the solar year, which means the month of Ramadan, because they follow a strictly lunar calendar, the month of Ramadan can happen in any season. It repeats itself every 354 days, and every year it moves 11 days earlier in the solar year cycle. However, in the Jewish calendar, we have to obey lunar months and solar years, and therefore we have to accommodate for the extra unaccounted solar days with occasional leap months. So roughly seven times out of every 19 years, there's an extra month of Adar, there's Adar 1 and Adar 2, and that keeps the systems balanced. And the responsibility to faithfully maintain the Jewish calendar was the very first mitzvah given to the Jewish nation. Now it's important to realize that a functional calendar is an essential bedrock of Jewish life. If you don't have 
a calendar that everyone agrees upon, you can have holidays and festivals, you can have Yom Kippur, you can have Pesach. And we also have to have one calendar that the entire nation agrees upon. Our religion crumbles if me and my Jewish neighbor observe different days of the holidays, or Yom Kippur, or Pesach, or, or various festivals. Now, if there's a disagreement, for example, in the Gregorian calendar, the worst thing that can happen is that maybe contracts would get messed up, or people miss their tax filing deadline. In our world, if we don't have a unified calendar, we don't have a religion. And it's interesting to note that it's not only us who recognize this, it's not only the Torah, by making this a first mitzvah, highlighting its importance, but the enemies of the Jewish people as well, they realize that if you sever the Jewish nation from the Jewish calendar, if we cannot have a functioning calendar, we cease to exist as a nation. During the second century before the Common Era, the Syrian Greeks, Antiochus, one of the things that he forbade, he forbade three things. The observance of Shabbos, the observance of circumcision, of, of bris milah, and the assignment of new months, the Jewish calendar. Because they recognize these are the things that keep the Jews Jewish. If we don't have Shabbos, we don't have Judaism. If we don't have the symbol the brand of Judaism. We don't have circumcision. We don't have Judaism. And they also realize something very deep. If you take away the ability to have a calendar that keeps the Jewish year in sync, that's going to derail Judaism. And of course, those edicts are what spurred the Maccabean, the Hasmonean revolt, which led to the Hanukkah miracle, which led to the Jewish people reinstituting sovereignty over the land. What's the process of determining the new moon and what are the various episodes that happened where things kind of went a little bit awry? So as we mentioned, the moon has phases. During the end of this cycle, so if you go out and look at the sky during the final days of the month, you'll see that for about two days or so, you won't see a moon. It'll be moonless nights. At the beginning of the month, you'll see a slight crescent of the moon. We see only one edge of the moon. That's called the waxing crescent. It's a small sliver on one side, on the right side. That day where you see the new moon, that, that's called Rosh Chodesh. That's the first day of the new month. 29 days later, all eyes are on the sky. 29 days after the first day of a given month, it's a question, will this, will this night, will this day be Rosh Chodesh, i.e., will we see it tonight, and will this day, this month, will this month be a month of 29 days, or will we only see it the following night, and then this month will be 30 days. So every month, is, you're kind of in flux. Is day 30 from the previous month, is that day one of the following month, or is day 31 the first day of the following month, and day 30 was the last day of the preceding month. Now, this system of figuring this out was a hybrid of human testimony, where all the Jews would go out that night and stare in the, stare in the, sky, in the sky and see if we could see that sliver of the new moon, together with complicated astronomy. Now, the Rambam, in his laws of sanctifying the new moon, he writes, this is chapter 1, Halacha 6, quote, Based in Mechash and Bonos, the based in the court, they make calculations in the same ways that the astronomers do calculations, that they know the locations of the stars and the various orbits, and they painstakingly study these systems until they know if it's possible, if it's feasible for the new moon to appear on this night. And if it is feasible, then they sit and wait. Are there going to be witnesses that have seen it anywhere in the Jewish world that could come and provide testimony about what they saw? And if witnesses come on day 30 and we vet them, we check them, we interrogate them, we investigate their claims, and it turns out that they're okay, well, then we assign day 30 is the first day of the next month, and the previous month only had 29 days. However, if we know that according to astronomical calculations, it's not possible 
for this month to be a short month, it has to be a long month, then we don't wait for witnesses. And if witnesses come, there's two options. Either they're lying, which is very problematic, as we'll see, or they saw something, maybe they saw some clouds, they saw something, but it wasn't the actual waxing crescent of the new moon. So what was the procedure? This is where it gets interesting. The court, the Sanhedrin, its seat of rule was in Jerusalem, in the temple, for the vast majority of history. Of course, after the temple's destroyed, they moved out of Jerusalem, went to various different places. The Talmud, the book of Rosh Hashanah, delineates all the various places that the Sanhedrin was exiled from place to place. The testimony of the new moon had to be done specifically in front of this court, the Sanhedrin, together with the greatest rabbis of the time. Therefore, the witnesses, well, they had to come to Jerusalem. So suppose you're in Hebron, or you're in Tiberias, or you're anywhere within walking distance. You could get there within a day or so, and you see the new moon. You have to travel to Jerusalem to go present your case as a witness in front of the court. What if you see it on Shabbos? It's Friday night. It's day 29. And you look up and you see with your friend, two witnesses, you see the new moon. Are you allowed to travel to Jerusalem on Shabbos, desecrating the Shabbos? Because the law is that with that on Shabbos, you're not allowed to leave your city. So you're in Hebron. Are you allowed to leave to Hebron? No. So leave, traveling to Jerusalem, even if you're doing it by foot, would be prohibited by Shabbos law. Says the Talmud, based upon sources, you are allowed to desecrate them. Because this is such a fundamental need for the Jewish nation, if you see testimony that can be admissible in the court to substantiate the claim of a new month, you even allow to go on Shabbos. The Talmud goes on to say even further, if someone is sick, the, the, the witness is sick, they're allowed to travel on a donkey on Shabbos, allowed to be carried by people. If there's a concern that there's bandits on the road, they're allowed to bring clubs to go beat them up. If it's a very far distance, they're allowed to carry with them provisions for the way. As we know, one of the 39 prohi- prohibited activities on Shabbos is you're not allowed to carry something from one domain to another domain. Or you're not allowed to carry from within the public domain four cubits. Says the Talmud, however, in this instance, because it's such a fundamental need, the laws of Shabbos are pushed aside. Now, the Talmud actually brings an interesting debate. What if it's very clear? It's a clear sky. There's no clouds. There's no obstruction. There's no light pollution. You can see very clearly there's a new moon. According to one of the beginning of the Talmud, you're not allowed to desecrate the Shabbos. Because if you see it so clearly here in Hebron, let's say, it's quite likely that someone who's already in Jerusalem also saw it. And therefore, you're not allowed to desecrate the Shabbos when your testimony is probably not needed. That's one opinion of the Talmud. According to other opinions of the Talmud, which is actually the halacha follows, that no, even if you see it, it's very clear and it's very lucid skies, you still travel even if it means desecrating the Shabbos. There's an interesting episode that highlights the concern and the, uh, the caution that the, that the rabbis had to make sure that people come give testimony. The Talmud says a story that there was 40 groups of witnesses traveling on Shabbos to Jerusalem. And they're passing through like a convoy, a caravan of all these witnesses. And they pass through the town of Lod. And the rabbi of that city was Rabbi Akiva. And he sees all these people coming. And he says, wait a minute, if so many people saw it, and they're all traveling to Jerusalem, it must be the people in Jerusalem saw it as well. So he stops them. He says, no, no, you can't desecrate the Shabbos. You can't travel all the way to Jerusalem. But later on, the great Rabban Gamliel, he said, you made a huge mistake. Because all those people, you inconvenienced them all. They saw the new moon. They said, oh, we're going to Jerusalem. We're going to contribute our testimony. Halfway there, you come and you stop them. What's going to be next time? Next time they're going to see a new moon and it's not going to be so obviously patently clear to everyone that someone in Jerusalem probably saw it as well. And these people, these 80 people that you made their lives miserable by stopping them, they're going to say, I'm not showing up. I don't want to be stopped again. And then you're going to disrupt and derail this process that is so vital 
for the continuity of the Jewish people, which does demonstrate, again, the, the primacy that the Torah and its sages assign to this process. So these witnesses at Jerusalem, and they would have a courtyard near the temple, and they would wine and dine these witnesses again so that they would want to come. And they would start interrogating the witnesses, first come, first serve. And they would bring them into the room and separate the two witnesses. And they would start asking them questions. Oh, you saw the new moon? What did it look like? Did it look like this? Did it look like that? Was it leaning to the north? Was it leaning to the south? How high was it in the horizon? All these questions to see, to vet their claim. And they even had molds that they made of various kinds of moons. And they would show, did you see like this? Did you see like that? And they would investigate the two witnesses separately. If their testimony was proper, and it seemed like they're telling the truth based upon all the procedures of interrogating witnesses of a, in a Jewish court of law, they would bring in everyone else. And they would ask them again preliminary questions. They wouldn't do the heavy investigation because they already know they have two good witnesses. But they would ask them questions just so those people don't feel like we came to Jerusalem for nothing and they'll come back next time. And finally... The head of the Sanhedrin, the head, the Rosh Basin, the Av Basin, the head of the court will get up in front of everyone and announce on top of his lungs, Mikudosh, which means it's sanctified. And the entire nation would respond, Mikudosh, Mikudosh, it is indeed sanctified. And right away, all the laws of Rosh Chodesh would kick in. That day was Rosh Chodesh. So what happens now? Everyone knows today is Rosh Chodesh. But that's only the people in the room. You have Jews living in the northern northern part of Israel. You have Jews living in the southern part of Israel. You have Jews living in Babylon. You have Jews living in Asia Minor. You have Jews living in Persia. You have Jews living anywhere. How do you amplify this message? How do you spread the message throughout every corner of the Jewish world, which day is Rosh Chodesh? So the Talmud says, very interesting. They came with an innovative solution. You have Jews living a thousand miles away in Persia. You have Jews living a thousand kilometers away in Babylon. They need to know which day Rosh Chodesh is, day 30, is day 31. So their solution was like this. This is, of course, before email and before television and before Twitter. What they do, they would take sticks of cedar wood and they'd wrap it, make it like a, into a torch. And if day 30 was Rosh Chodesh, i.e. the previous month was only 29 days, they would go onto Mount Olives, which is the mountain right next to the Temple Mount, and they would light the fire at that night. And they would start waving it in the darkness until the people in the next mountain who were sitting there waiting to find out was today Rosh Chodesh or not, they would see, oh, they're, they're shaking the, the torch. So those people would take their own torch and light it and shake it on their mountain. And that way it would hop from mountain to mountain going traveling great distances at very high speeds. And finally, the entire diaspora, thousands of kilometers away, the message was spread that this past day was Rosh Chodesh. And that way they would know, if you're living in Tehran, which is, again, a thousand miles away from Jerusalem, you could very quickly get the message which day was Rosh Chodesh, and that, that way you would know which day is Yom Kippur the 10th day of the month, which day is Pesach, the 15th day of the month, it's at which day is Purim, which day is Tishbav. All those pieces of information will be spread very quickly. So this system really worked great for many centuries. You have the court in Jerusalem. They're taking the witnesses. They're investigating them. They're interrogating them. They're inspecting them. They're assigning the new month, yes or no. Is it day 30, day 31? Spread the message to the rest of the Jews. Everyone knows when, the, when, when, when Rosh Chodesh is. And you're able to extrapolate from that when all the holidays are. Fantastic. But over time, the nation suffered from two groups of enemies from within that deliberately sought to mess things up, to sabotage and corrupt the calendar. These two groups are the Sadducees. Sadducees were the groups, essentially, that were Hellenists reborn, people who wanted to dilute the Torah and to dilute the Jewish nation. That's one enemy. A second enemy were the Samaritans, sometimes called the Kuthites or the Kusim in Hebrew. These were groups of people who were not biologically Jewish, but had converted 
to Judaism in mass. And there was a question whether they were genuine converts, were they gay ray emis, as the Talmud says, real true converts who were sincere about the conversion, or were they coerced converts? Were they converts that weren't really buying into Judaism and therefore they're not really they're not really Jewish? And both of these groups were thorns in the side of mainstream of the mainstream Jewish people for centuries and caused all kinds of problems. And each one of them tried to disrupt the process of the calendar in various ways. So the Talmud tells us that there was a story where the Sadducees, they tried to hire fraudulent witnesses to lie about what they had seen, witnessed the previous night. And they took two people, and they gave each one of them 200 gold coins. And they said, okay, when you go to Jerusalem, make up a cockamamie story. You saw the moon last night. Today's the first day of the month. And how would they know they're different? The court doesn't know. They say we saw it, and... They have to accept your claim because you seem to be, they don't know that you're secret Sadducees. And the story goes, the Talmud tells us in the book of Rosh Hashanah on page 22b, the first person was interrogated and it seems like everything he was saying was true. But the second person was a secret supporter of the mainstream Jews. The, the Sadducees thought they had found someone who was a conspirator, but he was really a double agent. He was a fifth column. And they say, he says, sure, sure, I'll make up the whole story. He gets into the room with the rabbis and he says to them, I saw nothing. I'm making up this whole story. And in fact, here's the 200 gold coins that they gave me to fabricate the story. And the rabbis realize they have a big problem on their, on their hands. If they accept testimony from anyone, thankfully this time they were spared the catastrophe of having the wrong month assigned. But what's going to be next time? Actually, the postscript to that story, they told the guy, you know what, keep your 200 gold coins, we're going to find the other guy, the people who were really trying to cause this corruption, and we're going to flog them. But as a result of this episode, they stopped accepting testimony from any random person who shows up. And they made a rule. If the court does not know you, if they don't know that you're righteous and you're one of us, your testimony is invalid. So if you were in Hebron or you were in Tiberias or you were anywhere in Israel, you don't know anyone in Jerusalem, and you see the new moon, your local court would have to send an emissary, a representative of their court that, that actually knows you and knows them to vouch that you are okay and you're not trying to deliberately sabotage the new month. That's an example of the kind of danger that they were faced. You know, when you have a system that relies on the integrity of witnesses, but the witnesses could be corrupted, you have to adapt for that scenario. Now, the Samaritans would never be considered for testimony because they were always viewed suspiciously. But they found a different way to disrupt the calendar. Once, on the eve of the 30th day, they surreptitiously took torches and climbed up the mountain. And they started shaking and waving their torches to the next mountain. The people in the next mountain, they're sitting there because they know tonight's the night. Will it be a new month? Will it not be a new month? Will it be tomorrow? And all they see is a torch of fire being shaken from the Mount of Olives. So what do they do? They're just following orders. They light their fire. And before you know it, the entirety of the Jewish diaspora was under the impression that day 30 was Rosh Chodesh. And how do you stop that? How do you undo that? It's, it's a terrible disaster because for that month, the people that could not be contacted were under the impression that, that the new month was indeed uh, the wrong day. And as a result of this episode, they stopped using the torch methods and they would send out messengers. And some places, you know, the Jews live very far out, very far-flung places. It took weeks for the emissaries of the court to reach them. I actually looked today in Google Maps to walk from Jerusalem to Baghdad. Baghdad was one of the biggest Jewish cities of the time. It was right in the Fertile Crescent where many, many Jews lived. To walk from Jerusalem to Baghdad takes 226 hours. 
It's nine days straight of watching. If you watch half a day, it's 18 days. And as a result of these horrific Samaritans, that had to be the new, the new thing. Every Jewish community, would, would, there were people, that was their main job. They would spend half the month walking to a certain place and half the month walking back to find out the information of the new moon and, and then travel out again to go inform Jewish communities all over the world. There's the interesting halacha that resulted from this. There's this concept called sveika de yoma. Sveika de yoma means a doubt of the day, which means if you were living in a place that was far away from Jerusalem, every month you would have a doubt which day was Rosh Chodesh. And therefore, some places they live 18 days away. So Pesach is on the 15th day of the month of Nisan. So what do you do? So people started observing two days. Outside of, outside of Israel, people started observing two days. They observed two and that way they had to cover all bases. And that became a result of this action of the Samaritans that all the people living outside of the immediate sphere of Jerusalem, they wouldn't know till later. Now, it's interesting. In Israel today, they only keep one day. And the reason why is because all the holidays, Israel's close enough to Jerusalem that the messengers would arrive in time before Pesach and they tell them which day is Rosh Chodesh and which day is, is thus Pesach. But there is one Jewish holiday that the entire Jewish world observes two days, and that's Rosh Hashanah, because Rosh Hashanah is the first day of the month. So if you're living in Tiberias, yes, you're in Israel, and you're relatively close to Jerusalem, but it still takes a while for the messenger to get there, and as a result, because it's the first day of the month, you're going to have to observe two days. That's an interesting result of the fact that no longer could we have instantaneous transmission of the calendar decisions of the court once the process of using these torch methods uh, had to be stopped. Now, after the temple was destroyed, the coronation of the new moon, all these laws, it moved with the Sanhedrin, which settled in the city of Yavne. But there was a new reality that arose at the time. As we mentioned, the responsibility of determining of deciding the final say of the new month was given to the Av Basin, to the head of the court. At that time, for the first time in Jewish history, the court itself, the Sanhedrin itself, was in Yavne, but the Av Basin, the head of the court, was elsewhere. That was Rabbi Yochanan Metzakai, one of the great figures of Jewish history. He was the head of the court, but he had left the city of Yavne and went to move to a different city called Brochayel. And therefore, okay, we have the court here, but we have the head of the Sanhedrin elsewhere who is the final say of determining the new month. So what they agreed upon is that the Nasi, which is the president who was in Yavne, his name was Robin Gamliel, he would be the one to stand in for the Afbeistin because Afbeistin was elsewhere. Now, after Rabbi Yochanan Metzakai died, they appointed a new sage to be the Afbeistin. His name was Rabbi Yehoshua, Rabbi Shua ben Hanania. But... Since it had already been established for several years that the Nasi, that Rabbi Gamliel, would oversee these deliberations, he maintained it as such. Once, there was a dispute between Rabbi Gamliel, the Nasi, and Rabbi Yehoshua, the Avbeisin. The story goes, the witnesses came to Yavne and they claimed that they saw the new moon on the eve of the 30th, i.e. day 30 is the first day of the following month. Problem is, the following day, following night, everyone went outside and they didn't see the moon on day 31. Now, of course, how is it possible to claim that you saw the moon yesterday and every day until the middle of the month, it's going to grow, it's going to be appear bigger in the sky, and if you saw it yesterday, most surely you'll see it today. But somehow it was totally invisible on day 31. And one of the sages said to Rabbi Gamaliel, obviously these people are lying. If they saw it yesterday, you for sure see it today. And they gave, one of the sages even gave an, an example. If I told you that a woman gave birth yesterday, but she's still pregnant today, obviously you lied to me, or I lied to you when I said that she gave birth yesterday. So if the new month sort of gave birth yesterday, it, would, it wouldn't be pregnant today. But Rabbi Gamliel insisted that this testimony is valid, and day 30 is the first of the new month. Rabbi Yeshua who's the Av Beisden, he disagreed and he demurred. And he had a case. After all, he was 
the Av Beisden, the head of the Sanhedrin. And for centuries, the head of the Sanhedrin was in charge of being the arbiter, of being the final say of these laws. So what to do? Who to follow? This is a standoff. And to make things even naughtier, that particular month was Tishrei. The 10th day of Tishrei is Yom Kippur. According to Rabbi Gamaliel, day 30 was day one, so day 39 was Yom Kippur. According to Rabbi Yeshua, day 31 was the first day of the month, and thus day 40 is Yom Kippur. And if you think about it, there's a potential schism here brewing amongst the nation. And this is right after the temple's been destroyed. We know the temple's been destroyed because of fighting between Jews, infighting and discord and disunity amongst the nation. And now we see the two greatest rabbis, or two of the greatest rabbis of the time, have a different Yom Kippur. So what happened? So Talmud describes what happened. Rabbi Gamliel, the Nasi, sent a messenger to Rabbi Yoshua. And he says to him, I am making a decree upon you. You must show up to my house on the day that you think is Yom Kippur. I want you to come with your staff, with your money pouch, and I want you to march on Yom Kippur. The day that you think is Yom Kippur, I want you to desecrate it. Because really my day of Yom Kippur is correct. And of course he was very distressed. And he went to Rabbi Akiva. And Rabbi Akiva said to him, listen, Whatever Rabbi Gamliel does, because he's the head of the court or he's the one who's in charge of determining this, this is the law. And we don't question it. And even if he's wrong and you're right, because he was the one who declared that day 30 is, is the new month, that becomes the new month. And he, he even it says an interesting idea. He says that God awaits the Jewish nation and the Jewish court to decide when the new month is. Don't worry, you could follow him. He went over to the other rabbi, the rabbi who had made the connection, the comparison between uh, a woman giving birth and still being pregnant the next day. And he said to them, listen, if you question the court of Rabbi Gamliel, you have to question every court. What did he do? He took his staff, he took his money pouch, and he marched to Yavne and went to Rabbi Gamliel on the day, day 40, which he thought was Yom Kippur. When he walks into the room, Rabbi Gamliel gets up and he walks over to him and he kisses him on his forehead. And he says to him, come in peace, my teacher and my student. You're my teacher because you're more wise, but you're my student because you accepted my ruling. And the commentaries explain that Rungamliel, his objective was to ensure that there's going to be unity amongst the nation. And therefore he flexed his muscles and forced his hand even if maybe Rabbi Yeshua was a greater scholar, but so what? We have to remain united as a nation, especially in the wake of the destruction. Now, it's interesting, as just as a postscript to this story, there were several other clashes between Rabbi Gamliel and Rabbi Yeshua. The way things operated in the Sanhedrin was that you had to be called upon by the Nazi to speak, and then you would stand up, and you could only sit down when the Nasi gave you permission to sit down. And what happened was, is that there was an argument on an unrelated matter between Rabbi Gamliel and Rabbi Yeshua. And in order to, again, ensure that the authority of the Sanhedrin is not questioned, the authority of the Nasi is not questioned, after Rabbi Yeshua was standing, Rabbi Gamliel did not tell him to sit down. So for the rest of the lecture, Rabbi Yeshua had had to remain standing. And this happened a third time. The Talmud records a debate in the court, in the Sanhedrin, in Yavne, as to whether or not the Mairiv prayer, the evening prayer, is it obligatory or is it voluntary? Now, Rabbi Yoshua, he was of the opinion that it was voluntary. But Rabbi Gamliel was of the opinion that it was obligatory. And he said, he was giving a lecture, he says, okay. I believe that the Meyer of prayer is obligatory. Does anybody here disagree? And he knows that Rabbi Yeshua is in the room, and Rabbi Yeshua disagrees. Rabbi Yeshua doesn't want to pick any fights. He just remains silent. Rabbi Gamil says to him, I command you, give me your opinion. And he just says, I, I don't have an opinion. And he denies any disagreement. The Nasi, because he knows, Rabbi Gamil, because he knew that Rabbi Yeshua had 
privately expressed an opinion that was voluntary, he called upon witnesses and says, testify that Rabbi Yeshua declared to you that he believes that the Meyer of Prayer is voluntary. And as a result of that, he made him stand again, and he didn't let him sit down for the rest of the lecture. Now, this was a problem. This was pushing it too far, because Rabbi Yeshua was one of the greatest sages of his time. Rabbi Gamliel, indeed, was just trying to ensure that the Jewish nation remains united. But this was a bridge too far, and the entirety of the people, all the sages, all the assembled, they declared, I'm sorry, Rabbi Gamliel, you have to abdicate your position. We're demoting you. You're no longer going to be the Nasi. We're no longer going to listen to you. The, the end of the story was they had to appoint a successor. Well, who to choose? Well, the obvious choice would have been Rabbi Yeshua himself. But they felt that if you choose Rabbi Yeshua, who was the object of this controversy, it would be a slap in the face of Rabbi Gamaliel. Rabbi Gamaliel, after all, is a direct descendant of King, of King David. He's a great-grandson of, of Hillel. You don't want to mess with him. And he, of course, was one of the great sages. Maybe he took his authority too far, but we don't want to slap him in the face by appointing, so to speak, his quote-unquote opponent as his successor. The other obvious option was Rabbi Akiva. The problem with Rabbi Akiva was that this is a role given to royalty. And Rabbi Akiva was a descendant of, of converts. And it would be inappropriate for someone who was essentially from the family of kings, the direct descendant of King David, to be replaced by someone who was a descendant of converts. So what they came up with an interesting solution. Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah, he was only 18 years old. He was fabulously wealthy. He was a direct descendant of Jewish royalty as well. He was 10 generations removed from Ezra. And they also made this decision with some foresight. They recognized that whoever they put in this position is going to be on very precarious grounds. Why? Because inevitably, Rabbi Gamaliel is going to be reinstated. And when he's reinstated, this person who served the role as the interim Nasi is going to be in a weird place because he was the Nasi, but now the original Nasi is going to be reinstated. So what to do with this sage? So they figured, we'll choose someone who's so young, who's not really a threat to Rabbi Gamaliel, and that way they could work together we could have like the senior Nasi and the junior Nasi. That was their idea. And indeed, after this episode happened, Ramli was demoted. He went to Rabbi Yeshua. He requested forgiveness. Rabbi Yeshua, of course, immediately forgave him. He himself went back to Yavne, lobbied for Rabbi Gamliel's reinstatement, and indeed Ramli was reinstated. Rabbi Lezab and Azariah, the 18-year-old, they didn't demote him. And what they agreed upon, the Nasi would give the lecture every week. Three out of four weeks, Rabbi Gamliel would give it. And the fourth week, Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah would give it as the co-Nasi or as the junior Nasi. Now, this hiccup in the system of calendars where rabbis are disagreeing about the new month, that's going to be the least of the problems facing the Jewish calendar. For one, the Jewish calendar can only be assigned in Israel. The only exception to that being if the greatest sage of the time is outside of Israel, then that he can do it outside of Israel. But for the most part, it had to be done in Israel. Now, at this time already, the majority of Jews are living outside of Israel, primarily in Babylon. And over the course of the centuries, the Torah leadership is going to progressively move east to Babylon. And the balance of power, so to speak, in these the Torah centers of Israel and Babylon is going to swing heavily towards Babylon. If the greatest sages are going to be elsewhere and the calendar can only be assigned in Israel, it's going to be a problem, number one. Number two, the only people who can do this, who can fix the calendar, are people who have smicha. Smicha means rabbinic ordination, but specifically ordination, rabbi, the student, uninterrupted, beginning with Moshe. And those people or that reality is going to become a dying breed in the centuries following the temple's destruction. Moreover, it had to be done in conjunction with the Sanhedrin, an institution that is going to be progressively weakened over the course of the centuries. And finally, it's a very cumbersome activity. You have to make the ruling in the Sanhedrin, and you have to send out maybe 100 messengers all over the world to spread the message to Jews living in every part of the world. 
And already during those times, it was getting tougher and tougher. Uh, For one, the Romans made a campaign against smicha. The Talmud tells us in the book of Sanhedrin that there was once that probably during the Hadrianic persecutions of the early 2nd century, the Romans made a decree that every person who confers smicha will be executed, every person who accepts smicha will be executed, and in line with Roman brutality and collateral damage, the entire city in which smicha is conferred will be destroyed. The problem was, is no one gave, everyone's scared to give smicha. And the rabbis who are the previous generation who have smicha are getting older and they're dying. What's going to be with Jewish continuity? So there was one great rabbi, his name was Rabbi Yehuda ben Baba, and he came up with a solution. He took five students and they went between two cities, exactly between two cities. So it's not any city, not any one city. He took five students and gave them smicha in that secret location. The problem was is that there were enemies of the Jews who were following them. And when they saw him giving smicha to them, they quickly whistled to the Romans, and the Romans pounced. And Rabbi Yudam Abba was an elderly sage. He told the students, flee for your lives. Let them take me, but let them not touch you. You are the future of the Jewish nation. And that kept smicha ongoing for one generation, and that allowed the process to continue. Who were those great sages? Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Elazar, the great sages of the Mishnah. Those were the people who were, the smicha program was kept alive thanks to this great heroic act. When the Romans captured him, they didn't give him due process. The Talmud describes that they threw so many spears into him, they made him like a sieve. But this again shows that this equilibrium where this maintenance of the Jewish calendar is possible is not going to last very long. There was also a time where the Romans disallowed the making of leap years. The Talmud in the book of Yavamas on page 122, it tells that Rabbi Tiva was escaping persecution, traveled all the way to Babylon only to make a leap year. He went to do a job that could not be done in Israel. He had to travel to Babylon to do it. So in the middle of the 4th century, it's clear that the Sanhedrin is on its final years. The vast multitudes of Jews do not live in Israel anymore. And the Sanhedrin is led by Rabbi Hillel, sometimes called Hillel II, sometimes called Hillel the Last. He was a great, great, great grandson of Rabbi Judah the Prince, and of course, a direct descendant of Hillel, the original Hillel, Hillel the Babylonian. And he made a decision that forever altered the history of the Jewish calendar. He preemptively consecrated all the new months forever and the system of leap years forever. And thenceforth, from that point forward, about the year 358 or 359, according to most opinions, the calendar became automated. Now, if you remember earlier, we said that the system of determining the new months and, and, and the leap years, it was, a, it was a hybrid of the astronomical calculations and the witness testimony. In absence of the ability to accept testimony, the Sanhedrin can use the calculations to determine the new months and the leap years. And this, one of the final acts of the Sanhedrin, it actively assigned all the new months for the future ahead of time. And it's interesting, there's, a, there's an interesting dilemma that, Uh, resulted now that the calendar is fixed. And until today, we're using this system, this calendar that he instituted. Now, if you remember earlier, we we mentioned that the only reason why we have two days of Pesach and Shavuos and Sukkot, etc., it's only because the messengers could not reach all the parts of the diaspora in time. But now that we have the calendar that's fixed, we know exactly which day is the first day of the month, which day is the last day of the month, which is the 15th. We know that. There is no more Sveika Dioma. There is no more doubt as to which day was Rosh Chodesh because now it's all fixed upon the astronomical calculations. So why are we still observing two days of the festivals? I saw uh, online uh, there is a talk show host by the name of Dennis Prater. And someone asked him a question, well, why are you not Orthodox? He says, well, this is why I'm not Orthodox. Because the Torah says Pesach is seven days. All the Orthodox observe eight days. They have two days in the beginning, two days at the end. And now that we know when the first day of the month is, 
we should observe only one day of Yom Tov and not two. Now, it's interesting. He asked this question. If he were here, I would tell him, you know what, Mr. Prager, it's not your question. The Talmud asked the very same question. The Talmud, the book of Bates on page 4b, tells us, quote, initially, they would send these fiery torches. Once the Kuthites, once the Samaritans messed up, they would send the messengers. But had the Kuthites gone away and we, got, we went back to the system of waving the fires, we would only observe one day. And in the locations where the witnesses get there in time, we also observe one day. Ask the Talmud. Now we know it's been established. The calendar's ahead of time. Why do we still observe two days? Great question. And the Talmud answers. The reason why we do it is because the sages of the time, the sages in the Sanhedrin in Israel, that they made this calendar and they got rid of any doubt of the new of which day is, is the first days of any of any given month. They sent a message with this new calendar. Be very careful with the customs of your ancestors and do not cease observing two days of holidays. Why? Because if it's possible there's going to be another decree and we're going to lose the secret of maintaining the calendar and therefore we're going to have to go back to two days and if we don't, ha- if we don't maintain that, it's going to stop everywhere. So the Talmud is very clear that the reason why we observe in modern times after the decision of Hillel II to codify the, the, the calendar for perpetuity, the reason why we observe two days of, of holiday has nothing to do with any doubt. Rather, it's rabbinic edict in case people forget. Now, of course, there's been many books and doctoral theses written about the Jewish calendar and there's many different aspects of it. We cannot hope to comprehensively cover it all in the time allotted, but I want to just run through some of the other interesting tidbits about the Jewish calendar uh, that are interesting to just note. So the first one is the 247-year cycle. In the 9th century, one of the Gaonim in Babylon, in the, in, the, in the city of Sura, his name was Rav Nachshon Gaon, and he devised a system that spread the calendar not over one year, not over 19 years, but over 247 years. Essentially, it's 13 cycles of 19 years. And the idea is that every 247 years, the calendar is identical. And that system was incorporated in the great Ashkenazic work of Halacha of the 13th century. The tour was slightly updated, but roughly we're following that same system. If you go back 247 years from today... The, it's the same day of the week, it's the same Hebrew day, it's the same Gregorian day, it all works out to perfection. So that's just another interesting little tidbit. Uh, there's another whole area of the Jewish calendar that is quite problematic and controversial, and that is the question of the international dateline. If you are directly under the sun, it's 12 noon wherever you are. But at one point in time, it has to switch over from Sunday to Monday, from Monday to Tuesday. So there is the international dateline, which is agreed upon by the whole world somewhere in the Pacific. Monday turns into Tuesday, etc. The question is, where is the halachic dateline? And the problem is, is that there were Jews living, even today, there's Jews in Hawaii. Is Hawaii on the, does it go with the western side? Does it go with the eastern side? Does it go with the United States? Does it go with Asia or Japan? Uh, particularly critical during World War II, there were thousands of Jews in Japan and they had this question and the various opinions gave different answers because some of the halakhic authorities that existed in the time, in in the 1940s, two of the greatest halakhic authorities gave different answers as to which day it follows. And that caused all kinds of problems. So what they would do is they would observe two days of Shabbos and they would observe three days of Pesach and they'd have three Siddharim. But the biggest question was what to do on Yom Kippur. Are you going to fast for 48 hours? That sounds like it's quite difficult. So there was a disagreement, and most opinions followed the Chazon Ish, who was the greatest authority of his day. 
Uh, but there were some people who did fast indeed for two days. They would just, they'd remain comatose in their bed and they waited until uh, the both days of Yom Kippur were over just to cover all bases. There is a book written on this whole saga with all the mathematical equations and all the opinions and everything as such. There was another interesting dilemma with the astronauts. If you're an astronaut and you're in the International Space Center, so you're actually revolving around Earth every 90 minutes. So when do you dive in? Do you have to dive put on fill in every 90 minutes? That seems kind of exhausting. When do you observe Shabbos? Elon Ramon was an Israeli pilot and astronaut. He was actually one of the pilots that bombed the Osirak nuclear reactor in 1981. In fact, a little nugget, he was the youngest pilot and the only pilot that was unmarried. So when the Israelis set up the attack on Saddam Hussein's nuclear reactor, they said, okay, let's have all the married pilots go first. Let the unmarried guy go last. Because if anyone's going to get captured, it's most likely the one who comes at the end after the element of surprise has gone away. Of course, all of eight of them got back to Israel unharmed, but Ilan Ramon was the pilot who piloted that jet and bombed that nuclear reactor in 1981 in Osirak. So he, he was on the space shuttle Columbia, and he brought Torah scroll with him, and he had consulted some of the greatest rabbis in Israel as to what to do in space. And they told him that you observe the Shabbos in the location of your last residence, which at the time was Cape Canaveral in Florida. And of course, that is a solution to an intractable problem because you're traversing the dateline, whichever dateline it is, multiple times a day. So in conclusion, this is a, like we said, a fascinating subject. It is a little complex with the mathematics and all that, but it does show, I think, a lot of interesting things. First of all, The Talmud actually gives a very precise timeline for the length of a lunar month. The Talmud is very clear. It's 29 days, 12 hours, plus no less than 793 chalakim, which is 45 minutes and 3 seconds of change. And it's interesting, we have to ask ourselves, this is before NASA, somehow the greatest rabbis of the time were very accurate down to the millisecond of the length of a lunar moon, which is just an astonishing fact to just think about. Also, I think it's interesting to to note uh, all the Jewish communities in the far-flung corners of the world managed to maintain an identical calendar for millennia. How they did it, of course, they had to navigate some of the challenges of the time. And that also is, I think, an insight and a window into the Jewish life, how they were able to navigate these dicey times, these dicey challenges, all these rogue elements operating from within and somehow uh, with their tact and with their cleverness, they managed to keep the Jewish people together, unified in one religion under one calendar. Before we conclude, don't forget to go right now, givetorch.org and we really appreciate whatever you could do to support our organization, to support the podcast, to support all the other podcasts, And to be there as a friend and as a partner with all our efforts to connect Jews and Judaism, to broadcast Torah to the masses, I thank you for your help and for your support.